BYO Biz Program here at Champlain College, and we're the sponsor of this uh, speaker series. And tonight we have a great program for you. But before we get into that, I uh, will um, indulge myself with a few commercial messages about upcoming events. So, uh, the same time, uh, not the same place, uh, in Alumni Auditorium next week, Thursday, January 23rd, 7 o'clock, uh, we have uh, Wynn Smith is going to come and uh, talk. Uh, he was here a few weeks. In fact, he was the kickoff speaker in this series about seven years ago, talking uh, as an entrepreneur about uh, his venture up at Sugarbush. Uh, he's here next week to talk about his new book, uh, Catching Lightning in a Bottle, which is a sensitive drama about, no, it's a, um, <laughs> it's, his, it's the story of Merrill Lynch. Uh, and uh, those of you who know Wynn and know Merrill Lynch know that Merrill Lynch, uh, back in, when I was a child, was called Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith. And the Smith was Wynn's dad. So Wynn has a view of this company from, not the earliest days, because it started in the early part of the 20th century, but he has a pretty good perspective on it, not only uh, through his dad, but through the 28 years he spent there, uh, where he uh, rose to be uh, chairman of Merrill Lynch International and vice chairman of the company. He left uh, when the Stanley O'Neill era began and uh, the demise of Merrill Lynch began as well. So he has a, a, a unique perspective. He's got a new book. Uh, he'll be talking about that part of his life. <coughs> And uh, he's told me that he will bring some books and sign them. Uh, <laughs> because he can make a few bucks uh, selling a few copies. So that should be a great show uh, next week. Then February 11th, we switch gears a little bit. That's a Tuesday, I believe. Back here, we have a fellow named Josh Murphy, who is a has an interesting company called Unparalleled Films. He's an independent filmmaker, UVM graduate. Uh, and he started out doing action ski films because he was a ski bum, uh, moved into commercial production, uh, and now is doing feature films, and that should be interesting as well. Uh, one more, March 27th, uh, we have the new, newly uh, appointed editor of uh, Healthy uh, Living Media, Jesse Price, who's a fantastic lady. And uh, and a bit of disclo full disclosure, I've known her since literally she was about eight weeks old. But she's had a, a, a she's a fantastic career ride, a, a wonderful person, and so she'll be here on March 27th. And then one more uh, for all you students: um, the elevator pitch competition is coming up. Uh, I know some of you have already signed up and entered, uh, but that takes place in February, and I encourage all of you uh, to enter and compete and learn something, uh, uh, an important life skill. So enough on that. Now, I just want to say, in my life, I've been fortunate to know many uh, highly intelligent people. And I've been fortunate to know many people with amazing energy. But I must say, I don't think I've met anyone who has those two qualities in one person. And our speaker tonight uh, has a ma an amazing intellect and an amazing amount of energy that he puts to good use. So he's going to speak to us tonight. Uh, I love his title about his transition from a, a distinguished professor for almost 40 years, 41. At 41 years at Middlebury College, to his new life and career as an entrepreneur in the boat business. And I know there's some boat people uh, here, and I know they're mostly sailors. Uh, and uh, some of you expressed concern in the hall that you know we're a little uncomfortable being here because this is our boats. Uh, but I assured them that Michael is a sailor. So, you, so we, we can bridge that. Um, now, if we wanted somebody to come and talk to uh, starting uh, the uh, first stock exchange in Russia after the fall of the Soviet Empire, we could get Michael. 
If we wanted to talk to somebody who worked with many entrepreneurs and business people in Eastern Europe struggling to, to build a private economy out of uh, the wreckage of uh, the communist regime, we could ask Michael to speak about that. Um, we could uh, ask, gee, what's it like to mentor and guide many uh, entrepreneurs in this great state and who has probably put his uh, stamp on the economy of this state to all of the uh, entrepreneurial ventures that he has mentored and his students have mentored over the years at Middlebury. I guess we could get Michael to talk about that. But no, tonight we're going to get Michael to talk about his latest love. Sorry, Shirley. Uh, his latest <laughs> other love, his latest other love, which is Snake Mountain Boat Works. So let's have a nice warm welcome for Michael Fulton. This feels truly strange <laughs> because it was December 2010 when I was last in a room like this. And, and uh, I love being back. So for 41 years, I toiled in the academy. Um, I'm no longer there. I don't need a blazer anymore. I went to graduate school and I was trained as a general equilibrium theorist. We spun models of worlds that will never be and we thought we were really important. And then I came to Middlebury College and taught that stuff. And I kept walking into the classroom and saying, geez, you know, I wonder what's going on out there. And I quickly realized every student in this room comes to your college as a professional spectator. You've gone through years of school, and what have you learned? You've learned how to read a syllabus, how to figure out what the teacher wants. What have you primarily done? You've read books, you've read papers, you've written papers, and oh yeah, you've taken exams. Some of those courses might even have been about horses. How many times, and this is outside of Champlain College because this place is unique in the best possible way. But at Middlebury College, how many of those students ever actually saw a horse? In fact, even worse, how many of those students were ushered into a barn, the door was closed behind them, and as the person said, there's the horse, figure out how to ride it. You're smart. That set me on a course. During my entire academic career, my goal was to take students out of their comfort zones. I've now taken me out of mine. I got really good at that. And in 2002, I launched to the chuckles across the venture landscape in Vermont, the Middlebury Solutions Group, with the audacious claim that we we're gonna have college undergraduates do venture consulting engagements with founders of Vermont startups. And Karn Cross quickly became the most important mentor as he was founding Fresh Tracks Capital along with Charlie Kirker in my life because I went to him and I said, Karn, you know, I'm starting this course, Middlebury Solutions Group, right? From thought to action, Middlebury students steeped in econometrics and microeconomic theory and Sophocles are going to tell entrepreneurs how to make soap and get paid for it. And Karn was good and he said, well, let's talk through it and In the ensuing eight years, over 200 Middlebury College students went through this program. One of my goals was to change life paths. Every one of those kids graduated going off in, a, in directions that Middlebury students hadn't gone off in before. During that time, we did 67 engagements with 67 Vermont founders. The important number is that one. When I graduated in 2010, 56 
of those startups had taken what they got from the Middlebury Solutions Group, had gotten funded, and were still operating. I guess college students can help entrepreneurs find, what do we say in academia? The path forward, right? This is a list of some of those companies. I think you'll see many on there you recognize. But way back there in 2002, I got to say thank you, Scott Hardy. Thank you, Greg Kelly. Scott's the founder of Linkia. Greg, the founder of Teljet. These guys had done it before. They signed on, and I can never forget my first conversation with Greg. Are these, am I going to teach the students? Or are they going to teach me? Well, in truth, I'm a pretty good sales guy. And I, I can wave my hands. And I got them to believe. But you notice, right, every one of those companies is still in business today as we gather in this room. But I was troubled during that first year because, an first of all, I had to go out and find them. They didn't apply, right? We were the new guys on the block. Who wants to risk? The last thing an entrepreneur has is what? Money and time. And what did I want them to do? Man, I want them to spend, I mean, these kids, when they did their evaluations, this course, they claim they worked 30 to 60 hours a week outside of class on their project, on their consulting engagements. It became, it consumed them. But I didn't have a direction. And every one of these entrepreneurs would come in and I'd say, what would you like? What can we do for you? Give me a marketing study. I want a marketing study. I want a marketing study. Tell me how to market my product. And that just didn't sit well with me. I mean, it has to happen, right? So I spent some time thinking about, I've got a bunch of really smart kids who are gonna, they, they just bit onto this, they drank the Kool-Aid and they were ready to go, but they had no tools. Oh, I had, them, I had them read some of the business literature. What I discovered is most of those trade books, if you read the first 20 pages, you've read the whole book. Put it up on your shelf, get the next one, read the first 20 pages. Then I ran into a guy named Guy Kawasaki, The Art of the Start. Ah, structure. Except the guy doesn't really set it up for an absolute neophyte, and my students and the guy in the front of the room were absolute neophytes. So what I did was build what I called the zero-based business model. And from then on, every one of our clients hated me during the first four weeks of the term. Because the one statement that Guy Kawasaki has early in the book Great companies are built one customer at a time. And unless and until you know who your customer is, marketing study? Do you know what problem you're solving? So during the first four weeks of a 12-week term, my teams learn to be ruthless unless we can walk into the, that room with the rest of the clients and the rest of the kids and convince them that we can answer this. And I don't mean this eyewash marketing kind of big think, granular, how many, where are they, who are they, how do they buy? Well, you know what? It works. If you want to start a business, you have to answer those four questions. And then you can get to some of the rest. Look what's at the end. Marketing, right? And the toughest thing I, I tried to get through both to the clients and the students is that you market to segments. You don't market to markets. You've got to understand where the segments are. They're all going to be different. And if you're in an industry, in a space, where there's zillions of them, man, you've got a tough business. Right? This one is really important. 
Successful businesses are started with matches, not flamethrowers. Especially if you're in a space with a whole bunch of segments, find the low-hanging fruit, right? Get the product or the service out there. So, in August of 2008, surely it'll kill me for this, it seems that I built our house, our, our barns, our summer camp, and had just, we had just built a timber frame addition on the camp down in Lake Champlain. And we're sitting there, and I got my yellow pad out, and I'm doodling, and Shirley says to me, what are you going to do? What's that? I said, well, you know, at home, the green, that old solar greenhouse is dying. What if we built this a little bit wider, not quite so long? There. That nice romantic evening, the first one in our new space. Man, it was like it was February really quick. So I just, I, I, I'm smart enough, being Irish and French, I can still figure things out sometimes. I dropped that subject. Several months later, we were going somewhere, and, Shirley, and I started talking about it. I don't know why I would do this, but I started talking about it. Shirley turned to me and said, you like wood? You used to restore antique clocks. We've got this big old sheep barn that we don't use anymore. Why don't you go buy an old boat and restore it? Now that is cool, right? She doesn't know me well enough. She figured it'd take me two years <laughs> to find that boat. In August of 2008, we found ourselves in Meredith, New Hampshire. How much research had I done? You know, who's the customer, blah, 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 right? Them that can't teach, them that can do, well, where did we stop? We're driving into Meredith, and there's a boatyard full of wooden boats. <laughs> We're there. 20 minutes later, she's mine. <laughs> right? Isn't she beautiful? I mean, she's just lovely. She's a 1949, 22-foot shepherd. It turns out it's, she's an incredibly rare boat. But she had a few issues. So I got this guy to load her on a trailer that I now know was totally wrong for her. We dragged her over Ludlow Mountain, got lost. They were doing some work on Lake Dunmore, and suddenly pulling this big trailer in pouring rain, the road stops. It's blocked off. So I'm sure that that person into whose front yard I backed still talks about the time this idiot Right? Knocked our flowers down. So we got her home. That's Snake Mountain Boat Works. Doesn't that look great? Huh? We backed her into the Snake Mountain Boat Works. See any problems? What's on the floor? A whole lot of what? Not stuff that's good for varnishing a boat. Right? The boat needed a, just a little bit of work. How much did I know? I was out of my comfort zone, and I've done it to myself enough during my life. You know what I knew? I could do it. I could make it happen. I wasn't sure what it was going to be. But as you can see, we just had a big old sheep barn, an old pole barn I built in 77, 78. There she is. So, this was 2008. The economy had tanked. I found an auctioneer, Thomas Hershock, and started following him around to every time he had a wood shop being auctioned off. So, we took half the barn and we poured some concrete, had UFO come in and spray an inordinate amount of foam. Michael bought some tools. Michael bought some more tools. Hey, look what's here. Recognize the boat? She's in the shop. We're ready to go. Well, long story short, she got banished to the barn. And we just started restoring her last spring. In 2011, I added a showroom. Now why? If I'm going to restore your boat, why do I need a showroom? 
What I realized very quickly as I started trying to answer those first four questions was that you are not going to entrust me with the family heirloom Chris Craft unless you can see my work, right? Right? Let's see what you can do. Well, to give me your boat and I'll figure it out and I'll show you what I can do. No, nah, that's not going to happen. So what I decided to do is I was just going to buy a couple of old boats. Well, it turns out, old boats are really easy to buy. <laughs> I could probably buy 20 old boats a day and every one would be rare, right? Because it'd be even more derelict than the next old boat. Well, take, be sure to look at this one. Remember this boat. This is a 1958 Cadillac Seville. She may be the last surviving example. These two guys were in business for two years in Cadillac, Michigan, and they talked GM into giving them all the Cadillac logos, signage, and everything. And this boat was the toaster. If you bought a Seville in Detroit, you were offered this boat. Well, probably not quite that boat. So, I'm an academic. I started getting on the web. And I found this guy, Dan Dannenberg. Don Dannenberg is beyond the guru of wood boat restoration. He only has three guys working for him, but he has a global reputation. And this is his, the other lesson from Kawasaki, if you can't tell people what you do in a simple declarative sentence, what don't you have? You don't have a business, right? You don't have a business. So this was his. You know, I read this and why did he say restoration or preservation? We'll come back to that. But I'm an academic. He's written a book, all 700 pages of it. This is an incredible book. It is unbelievable. He is the most generous man in this field because this book is absolutely a how-to guide. He starts out, these are the tools you need to buy. This is how, you, I mean, the whole thing is like, but you know what's most important? You know what that is? That's a shepherd. If he put a shepherd on the cover, I made a great buy that first time, right? So Snake Mountain Boat Works was born. We're ready to go. But these things kept haunting me, right? kept haunting me. So what problem am I solving? Any ideas? What problem am I solving? Snake Mountain Boat Works. Bingo. We reverse the ravages of time. What ravages? There's little chief. She was amongst that group that was so easy to buy. She was also our first restoration project. Actually, she was our first preservation project. There's a difference and we'll talk about it. She looks pretty good, right? Shiny. She's got the wrong bow light. And if the photograph were bigger, you could see that the bungs that are filling the counter sinks have had so much water in them over the years, they all have little black rings around them. What do you think? Ravages of time? That's the same boat after we removed all the rot. All those toothpicks, every single fastener hole must be filled with Gorilla Glue and toothpicks so that you have a good surface to receive the next fasteners. This is beginning the path down. I've reversed Dannenberg's order. Snake Mountain Boat Works preserves first, restores lot second. Restoring means, see all that cruddy old mahogany on the top sides? You can go out and buy nice new mahogany. It's easy to work. It's much easier to get a good finish on. But what's the problem? 
It's not old, is it? All right? Old boats are old only because they contain their old wood. So in this case, we did have to replace one plank at the back. We had to replace two planks uh, on the top sides. And we had to completely rebuild the frame of the boat. It was a perfect boat to restore the first time, right? Because we had to learn everything. And what we quickly learned is when you screw up on boats, you can undo it on wooden boats. Okay. So is there pain? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's pain. There was pain the day these, this couple pulled in with a, it was a late 50s, early 60s century resorter. Their century boats are infamous for being fast and leaky, because there's only one layer of, of mahogany. So they, they tend to leak. These people come in and I look at this boat and I say, what happened? Oh, well, it sank three weeks ago. And we were busy. So we left it there. Pain. Pain, right? Where are, where's my market? Where's my customer? Around the water. Good. How much water is there in the Northeast? How contiguous is it? This is a classic example of a highly fragmented market that has a myriad of local segments. The ACBS is the Antique and Classic Boat Society. There are 7,000 members in North America, Europe, and now Asia. So you'd say, well, they're, they're just go to the ACBS, go to their shows, go to their things, and it's going to be cool. You can, you've got all those people, right, who are slaves to their wooden boats. Well, the trouble is there's an ACBS chapter in Vermont and New York. We have about 100 members, most of whom like to do their own work. That's why they're members, right? So the challenge in this space trying to grow a business is to become visible. It's not like Janice Shade trying, starting True Soap. What problem was she solving? She wanted a wholesome soap for people to use. So she really, they're, they're, they're excellent channels, they're well developed, right? The channels. What I have learned, in the beginning, I thought, ah, just buy space advertising. And I put Vermont Business Magazine, I, I can't remember, two or $3,000 for a little ad. I got one job. Fortunately, it was a $3,000 job. <laughs> uh, but that fellow is doesn't have many friends in the, in the space. I tried the Addison Independent, I've, I've the New Hampshire Boat Museum, the Maritime Museum, I can go on and on and on. You know, I still advertise in the New Hampshire Boat Museum more as a donation to the museum than anything else. And I must, might as well give them a donation and get a little notoriety out of it. The truth is in this space, and this is critical when you're starting a business. How are transactions normally accomplished in this space? If it's done over the web, don't start trying to sell it on Church Street. Because right? people are used to buying this thing through, via the web. If it's, if it's done through distributors, right? please don't try to start distributing it yourself. Right? What business are you in? You're not in the distribution business. You're in the, I'm going to fix the X business. So I had to figure out how to make myself visible. Well, I started going to shows, putting, doing workshops, inviting people to the shop. It doesn't quite look like that old barn anymore. I 
gave talks places. Right? But what finally became our channel to reach our customer is right there. We don't transact over the by the web. But I discovered that since I'm an academic, I'm comfortable on my feet. Right? And I started building both a website and then a YouTube presence where we now have over 150 videos posted right? that laid out our secret sauce. Right? We save old wood boats. Kawasaki would smile. That's our business. We save old wooden boats. That's what we do. Right? But we do it upholding the highest standards of craftsmanship. We will not do a backyard fix. There are a lot of people who want to sell their wooden boats, but no, they're kind of shabby. Would you, would you just sort of scuff the varnish, put another couple coats on, polish the metal a little bit, and, and make it look presentable? And I'd look at the boat, I said, my name's gonna be on that boat, right? My name, because the seller is going to say, oh yeah, we had Snake Mountain Boat Works go all the way through this boat. It's in perfect shape. We won't do it. We do it one way. We do it the right way. That means we're more expensive than a lot of the competition, and we lose jobs. You know what? I'm happy to lose every one of them. And finally, we're preservationists. We will not replace a piece of wood we can save. And that's expensive too. Because a lot of times an old piece of wood's been beaten up, been sanded too many times, and it takes a lot of work to make it presentable and then all the planks in the neighborhood with it also presentable. And I love to talk, as you can tell. We communicate. We communicate with our, from the beginning, I've made it a practice that every client whose boat is in the shop will hear from me every Friday. And then for the first couple of years, I would get on the computer and start writing emails, and these long, laborious emails with some photographs. But I was shooting video all the time and putting it up on YouTube. French and Irish, you know. Uh, so, how do we market who we are? As I said, we tried print. I guess when I become the mega boat shop in, right, this part of Lake Champlain, I'll be out putting space out. Right now, it's just, it's taking resources I need desperately for other things. So I'm, I just stopped. Outside of New Hampshire, the museums and those kinds of things, right? We go to boat shows. We go to boat shows to win. Both boats we put in the Vermont show won their class. There's no better advertising. First of all, your boat's sitting there for three days, and you're next to it for three days with a box full of brochures for three days, right? And you're, hey, come on, come on, you want to, let me talk to you about this Chris Crap, right? Um, we continue doing workshops. But unfortunately, we've got so much work to do right now. The cleaning out the shop so that we could actually, because our workshops aren't, hey, why don't you come in and have coffee and donuts with us? No, we take you through something, canvassing a canoe. Right? trying four or five different strippers. We make we put you to work. Well, it's, be, it's become difficult. I'm sorry, young people in the room. I have a Twitter account. <laughs> and I keep, and I also have a Facebook account. Facebook is, Facebook's gonna go away pretty soon. It's not, it doesn't fit. It doesn't reach the people I need to reach. Twitter, uh, maybe somebody in this room after this can grab a card, give me a call, and give me a, some training 
on how you can use Twitter. The problem is I should be, is it tweeting? I should be tweeting multiple times a day. How can I tweet when I'm digging bungs out of, the, out of a mahogany plank? I just, it hasn't worked for me. The cloud. This is a recent discovery, and this is gold. My son uh, restores and repairs and maintains PCs. So he's continually editorializing and, you know, kibitzing from the side, which means, Dad, you know, you really could do it right. So he introduced me to Dropbox, and I thought, geez, what a pain in the tail this thing is. Until I realized that I no longer had to drag a thumb drive between the shop and the house trying to keep all my records on it and making sure that the computer in the shop and the computer in the house and the computer at camp all have the same iteration of a document on them. That's cool. Then it hit me, you can share those folders. So what I'm now doing with every single client I can convince to use the tool is I create a shared Dropbox folder. And you get gigs and gigs and gigs of space. So every Friday, they'll get a half an hour video. And I can, it's, I think everybody in the room would agree, looking at the still pictures, and I'd look at this, isn't that varnish nice? Yeah, it's really pretty, right? That's the resort of the sink, by the way, after we finished with it, right? Um, but a moving picture with a voice that talks about this is why we're doing this here, and I'd really look forward to speaking to you about that. Our website, this technology is nice, whoop, I want to go the other way, was built by a Middlebury College alum, Zach Karst. We wanted it clean, minimalist, and to have one message. Oh, by the way, remember that Cadillac Seville? That's the Cadillac Seville. It's in our showroom now, right? after we finished. And I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm, the problem with the website, Anybody who's tech savvy in here knows you got to keep it fresh, right? It's almost worse than Twitter. And I actually, as I put this together, I started drilling down into my website. I'm going, oh my God, those boats aren't even here anymore. Right? So next week, I, I must, I must find a day to spend updating that. But for us, the gold is in YouTube. Uh, Welcome to our YouTube channel. I'm Michael Claudel, founder of Snake Mountain Boatworks. We're not going to force you through that. Uh, Bob talked. Reverse the ravages of time. And the that guy just will not shut up. Okay. Bob talked about the elevator pitch competition. We used to put all the students and all our clients through elevator hell. I just discovered something much tougher. Give an elevator pitch to a, to a, a video camera. It's awful. Because it, I mean, there's the camera. It's there. And none of you are here. And I'm supposed to be, Shirley said, geez, you're not very expressive. You didn't smile. You didn't smile. I had six hours into this by the time I finally got the last 60, uh, 74 seconds it is, and I said, screw it. That's what's going up. It has the right content, and it's not well presented, but that's the way it's going to be. But we, we now have almost 150 videos, and who's my customer? I think my customer at the end of the day is somebody who would really like to be able to restore his and maintain his or own, her own wooden boat. I really do, right? They're, they're 
some great customers. We have two great customers now. We're completely restoring a 1914 Palmer launch, which means right now it has no keel in it. Most of the ribs are gone. I mean, it just, we're keeping it together with bracing and bailing twine, literally. And they, they don't. Karen and Dick said, just bring it to me back in the spring. Make it right. So we have several kinds of videos. Um, how to remove and install teeny trailer pins. It's a real pain. So we put, I put together that kind of a video. We do a whole bunch of how-tos. But we also do the, hey guys, look what we've done videos most of the time. And each project we do, there are, I think I've put, this week, I think I've put 15 or 16 videos up on YouTube. They get watched. Those people call. I've gotten three jobs so far this year from the YouTube channel. That is gold. And what does it cost me? Flip camera, that's all I'm using. This is low rent. It's not that, right? And I'm behind it, and I'm making RJ and John narrate. In the beginning, it would be, I'm putting a screw in here. And now, especially John, well, let me tell you what I'm doing today. You know, and there he is, and he's got these hands that are clearly the hands of an artisan, right? Um, word of mouth. At the end of the day, in my business, it's about word of mouth. But you've got to figure out how to get that word scurrying around. The YouTube channel turns out to be one of our best. Also great is that we now have Snake Mountain Boat Works Preserve Boats in Lake George, Lake Placid, Lake Champlain, Lake Memphomagog, Lake Winnipesaukee. Every one of those people is a marketing torpedo for me. Wow, that boat looks great. Who did it? And I make sure when every customer leaves, there's a stack of those. Just happens to be in an envelope somewhere convenient in the boat, right? I, I don't push it on, it's just there. Right? So how's it going? Remember that first boat? Um, I'm going to, Tyler, I'm sorry, but She's going to Lake Winnipesaukee in the spring. Turns out that shepherd's an incredibly rare shepherd that is in just unbelievable conditions, 1949. We did not have to change a single plug in the countersinks. I had to do a lot of stripping, a lot of sanding, a lot of fairing to make sure that the surface was flat so that when you look down, you don't see a ski slope. But, and this is the family that we have the launch from. They came in, they saw this boat, and, see if I, the right one? It was not for sale, because this was the boat that started State Mountain Boat Works. Shirley and I are really emotionally attached to that. So, Karen said to me, and I won't give you the number, she said, if you'll sell to me, I'll pay you X. And I'll cover the cost of putting it back together. There's emotion, and then there's business. And you know those bills come every month, and we built this business thanks to Dan Wormy and the Merchants Bank trusting us, believing in us, with debt. I'm calling the Lawrence Miller Otter Creek model. Lawrence always used to tell me, I'm making beer for National Bank of Middlebury. Right? He blew, grew the whole business on debt. And then, this is Little Chief. A piece of Little Chief. Remember the one you saw all torn apart? Well, Little Chief. So it's October 30th, 2013. We're preparing Little Chief for an ocean voyage. Why? because he's been purchased by a family in Salzburg, Austria. 
So we'll start building this video and we can't send her on this trailer. The trailer is way too wide, so we're making up a special trailer uh, for her to sit on that will roll it into the 20-foot C container that within the next two weeks she'll sit comfortably on this trailer. So this is the trailer that she actually arrived on. We cut it all down so it would fit into the container. Satisfying end to a somewhat tense day. And there she is in her sea trials before she went to Salzburg, <laughs> right? She taught us how to restore boats. And she won first place in the, for utilities in uh, the Vermont Boat Show in 2012. And just... It's, uh... It's 19 degrees Fahrenheit this morning. We've had our first snow. Rusty okay. Bishop. I'm not going to take it all the way through this. You can Sporting find this on YouTube. Night. Snow and cold. So we'll have the winter in Europe. It's going to be a tight fit. And going into the container, the trailer has moved just a little bit laterally. And as a result. So we finally got her in. Well, she's going across the Atlantic in December to Hamburg, right? This poor boat was tied down. They, I said, how many lag screws can we put into this container? And the guy said, until you get tired. So off she went. And then I got a picture from Bernard. This is on Twin Lakes, the home of the sound of music, I think, right? On Christmas Day, this character, <laughs> we had to take all the fuel, all the oil, all the fluids out of the boat to ship it. So he puts oil in it, he puts gasoline in it, and he launches her and drove all around the, two, the, the Twin Lakes as fast as she'll go, and she'll do about 35. She's rather loud and evidently stopped traffic everywhere. You think I don't have a marketing agent in Salzburg, Austria? <laughs> huh? Uh, so, to date, and this is the way the facility looks now, we, we put up a, a storage facility on top of everything else. It's absolutely chock-a-block full, unfortunately mostly with dream projects that Michael could not resist. But every one of them's rare. Absolutely rare, right? And actually, some of them really are. We've done 36 boats at this point. We have seven in the shop this winter with four more coming. We've got traction. But the most fun of all is when we finish a project and we get the owners back, we go to Lake Champlain with the boat. Watch. And he's not here, so we don't. You'll recognize who this is. Whoops. Here comes Eleanor. Completely restored. Bimini affixed on her way to Lake Champlain and to her new home in Shelburne Bay. She escaped uh, an old barn. Anybody figure out who owns her yet? Crystal Bay, New York on Lake George, VA. This boat had been in a barn All the paint on the top at sides. Hacker on Crystal Bay for at least 20 years. The one thing I've learned is the YouTube videos really should not be longer than two minutes, but seven is so much more fun. We are launching
Recognize that person? Uh, sorry, Tyler. Recognize that guy? <laughs> this is what it's all about. That guy is that guy. Thank you very much. Sorry, I shut up, but I'd love to answer questions. You're welcome to come to the shop. I've got some business cards here. We're easy to find. There's 120 foot earth turbines erected on our property, so it's, it's a pretty good landmark. Um, but thank you so much. Any questions? Yes? When you look back on everything you did for marketing, do you think it would have been possible from the beginning to have a uh, like much more clear understanding of this is exactly the techniques I'm using as far as like YouTube, Twitter, and everything else? Or do you feel like that's something that you, because of the business, you kind of had to feel your way into I think I'd, I'd like the other entrepreneurs in the room to pick up on that, but my sense is that's something you had to grow into. Um, it wasn't like I was a software engineer for the last 20 years and I've got a, a new toy. So I'm going to leverage that 20 year experience into turning this new toy. And I mean, we were literally transforming a sheep barn where Shirley and I raised sheep into a business that I, mean, I used to restore antique clocks. They're really small boats. Right? A lot of the technique is the same, but that was strictly small scale in the basement kind of stuff. I mean, here I've got two guys working full time. I got to meet a payroll. And we had to learn, fortunately, because Dan Wormy supported us, we had the luxury, and I didn't have to take an income out of it. I just had to pay my guys. We had the luxury of being able to have a very shallow ramp, and we screwed up. I mean, I bought a bunch of boats that I finally just put on Craigslist and went, <laughs> right? Because they were dumb purchases. Particularly, I bought several fiberglass boats. We restored one fiberglass boat. Angelo Lynn's 1972 Hydrodyne ski boat. And that thing terrorizes Lake Dunmore now. And we did a great job. It took me a year to get that GD fiberglass dust out of the shop so that I could varnish again. Um, so the other challenge as you start a business, I'm sure there are people in here who have had the same experience. The beginning, any business that came in the door that would help me pay the bills was very, very, very hard to turn down. And the problem is, like that resorter, their hope was that we could put the boat back in the water for $5,000. Well, we blew through that in the first week, and we were still tearing things apart. Um, so I, could I advise the next boat guy? Yeah. yeah, I could. Would I? No. It's a tiny, tiny niche. I mean, there are 7,000 members in North America, Europe, and, and Asia on the ACBS. I mean, it's not a big group. Of those 7,000, 26 are under the age of 40. It's also an aging group, right? It's not a millennial space. Yes, Bob. So maybe ask a related question. So the, 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 the little template you put up at the beginning of the, the key questions you have to ask and the, the way your, your students were out there uh, uh, they were brutal. When in this journey did you first go, oh, I better answer those questions? Because it sounds like you got pretty far into this. I got, 
before you, so my question is, if, if, if you had yourself and your student crew, and you had signed up for your program, do you think this journey would have been different? Would have been much shorter. <laughs> we, we would have found the answer to your question much sooner, right? But, and Shirley kept asking me, you know, if this is a business, aren't you supposed to sell things? <laughs> you know, we spent two years on that Chris Craft and, that, and did some other jobs, but there weren't many other jobs and they were pretty small. Um, so, I, it, you know, I went to every boat shop within 100 miles of here and there, there are a couple large ones. There's Darlings in, in uh, Shalott and there's Spencer Boat Works uh, over across the lake. And then there's halls down, down lake a ways. But other than that, most of the people starring boats are doing it in their garages. And they take one boat at a time. Um, and I just didn't want to go there. I mean, now I can pay my bills. I still can't pay myself. It's fun. But the hours, the, you know, professors think they work hard. They just don't have a clue <laughs> what it's like to start something and grow it when you got to do it yourself. So 80-hour weeks are happen all too often. Um, but unfortunately, with this business and having the two guys I have uh, is fantastic. If we're doing a, a, a series of varnishing routines, and there's about an eight-hour gestation period between applications, or 10. If the next application is going to be at 2 in the morning, and I get up at night and look out there, there's John's truck, right? Or there's RJ's car. I mean, they, they know. They have full access. They manage the projects. Uh, they all had to read Dannenberg's book. Neither one of them were very pleased, even though Shirley taught them English. Um, but after we did that, I'd be over on a bench working on something, and there'd be a Dannenberg says to do it this way. Now, we don't use Dannenberg anymore because he really believes in restoring first and preserving last. His advice is when you get a boat to do, the first thing your customer is going to see is the front deck. Replace all the wood all the time on every boat. Hello? What do you have then? You got a new old boat. And if you keep replacing, at some point you've, um, you've got a, a new boat that has an old name and maybe some old hardware and an engine in it. But, and for the sailors in here, Shirley and I own a J105, thanks to Jeff and Dorothy. And we love her. Um, we've done a vintage Lightning, complete restoration, a 47 Lightning. It was a lot of fun. Very, very difficult, because when you pull that hull apart, it just wants to twist. And we had to keep it true. Um, we just finished a, a year-long project on a cat boat. And unfortunately, it had a little one-cylinder 1910 vintage uh, engine in it that wasn't a very good engine the day it went in it. So, We've put electric propulsion in it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fiberglass. It was built as a fiberglass over wood skin boat. It was manufactured that way. And it came out to be really pretty. And I'm sh it's gaff rigged. And you'll see it out sh sailing out of Point Bay, I'm sure, um, next summer, I hope. Um, but most of what we work on is that, that's the other final point. A boat isn't a boat isn't a boat. We did one very early Canadian canvas-covered co canoe and covered it, recovered it, rebuilt it, put new gunnels in it, and lost our shirts. I mean, it, the boat's not worth enough for you to be able to charge for the time it takes. It takes almost the same amount of time to do a canoe as it does to take a, a powerboat of the same size. And you can charge for the powerboat and not the canoe. There are lap-straight boats that look like they have clabberds. The challenges there are entirely different than 
This is a plywood, bolted plywood boat. This one's really easy to work on, unless the plywood's rotted through. And it was all rotted right here. And fortunately, I learned to veneer while I was in the clock business. But I never put a piece of veneer on before that was almost three feet long. But we got it there. Um, so it's, uh, I've way overshot my time. So if there are no more questions. <laughs> yes, please. Um, were there any other moments where you're kind of, you know, learning sort of a new field? Were there any kind of moments where you kind of in, you felt like you were in over your head and did you have some sort of like fallback strategy to go back to or, you know, cause you, you keep forgetting I'm Irish book. and French. <laughs> <laughs> the book was. Uh, we've run into, we've run into problems that we just can't solve with what the three of us can bring to the table. What's amazing in this space is I can call up George Darling anytime I want. We're competitors, but you'd never know it. And I can say, George, I'm, I'm trying to solve this. I even called Dannenberg once. I thought, this is going to be fun. In his book, he says, here's my number, call. So I say, yeah, this ought to be fun. Because I can't remember, it was something early on, and we just didn't have a clue. And so I, I called the number, figuring I'm going to get a tree, and I'm going to yeah, leave a message, and some underling, Vanderberg. <laughs> so I said, no. He said, this is Don Danenberg. Can I help you? And he spent the next two hours on the phone with me. I mean, it's that kind of generosity. And now I figure that's sort of my goal. I, I field three to 10 calls a week from people who have seen things on YouTube, are trying to. There's one poor guy trying to restore a century Palomino, and I think he's not having a great time because he calls me two or three times a week, and, and, and it's always, why can't I do it this way? Because it won't work. Right? Uh, and so I really enjoy that, and as a result of those calls, I get other calls from, I mean, it's a little nucleus, right? Thank you. Very much. Good night.